Hi, it's Dwyer. The day before the fight, September 29th, 2023. Let's talk about Canelo. Let's talk about Jamel Charlo. Let's talk about some other fights. Let's talk about some NFL football bets. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, they've had the way in. I'm a little bit surprised that Jamel Charlo gained as much weight as he did, right? But understand, in my opinion, when you're dealing with a great fighter, and that's who both of these guys are, but let's focus on Jamel Charlo. When you're dealing with a great fighter, right, a guy who has been undisputed in his weight class, and when that guy walks around bigger than he does in the ring, and when he's fighting a guy who height-wise, in terms of reach and you know height, uh, isn't as big as him, right? When you add those things up, in my opinion, anytime the casino tells you that they're giving you better than a plus 200 on a surefire Hall of Famer, which is what they're doing on the Jermel side of the play. I think you need to take that. Right? So just understand, there are two bets that I like at the casino right now. I believe these are both mispricings. The first is Jermel Charlo, simply to win. I got him at a plus 259. Right? Plus 259. Folks, they're giving him less than a 33% chance of winning the fight. The other bet is a hedge. You have a really good hedge in this fight. If Charlo can't handle the punching power of the heavier weight class, and understand, Canelo really is one of the hardest punchers in the sport pound for pound, and here he's the bigger man. Right? This isn't like Charlo is fighting Inoue, who hits hard pound for pound, but would be the smaller man. No, he's fighting a guy who hits hard pound for pound and is more than one weight class up. So the under 10 and a half rounds has to be a consideration, just in case Charlo comes in and is in over his head. Or if it's an Amir Khan situation, Khan against Canelo, where, in my opinion, Khan's winning every round, right? But, of course, he gets hit once by Canelo, and that's it. Fight's over. If it's that situation and it ends within the first 10 and a half rounds, in other words, you get all the way up to the midway point of the 11th round, you're good with the hedge. Just understand, if either Charlo wins at plus 259 or the under 10 and a half hits at plus 219, if either happens, you make a profit. But let's tempt fate here. You understand that if Charlo, who has a punch, right, who stopped people like Jason Rosario, for example, Right, who stopped Erickson Lubin, who we'll talk about here, for example, who stopped Brian Castano in the rematch, right? Ever since Charlo joined up with Derek James, he's been a puncher, right? Ronnie Shields, who I love. Ronnie Shields is one of my favorite trainers, but Ronnie Shields is more of a learn how to cope in the pocket guy. Right? Derek James is a guy who's saying, hey, look, you can be out of the pocket. When you come in the pocket, let's set it up so that you have a moment where you get to throw your A-plus punch. So Charlo's episodic. He's also a closer. If he lands on Canelo and drops Canelo inside of the halfway point of the 11th round, then Charlo, who, by the way, is the older fighter, would put you in the penthouse. 
you would collect on both halves of the play and both halves of the play are greater than a plus 200. Let's just put it this way. I know there's a narrative going around that Canelo has been fading in recent fights and stuff like that. Now, that's a little true, right? Canelo does slow down. In the Ryder fight, for example, he does slow down. In that last Golovkin fight. But what I want people to do is to realize that it's my belief that Canelo, even before the recent fights, was vulnerable to a guy who could move and who could control his entry point, Canelo's opponent's entry point into the pocket and his exit from the pocket. Right? Let's revisit the Miguel Cotto fight. I'm telling you that Cotto and Freddie Roach, who was in Cotto's corner, were stunned at the scoring in that fight. Now, Canelo had his moments. That's true. Canelo's an excellent fighter. But Cotto was able to pick his spots on when he entered the pocket and when he left the pocket. Right? That's very important here. Understand, Charlo's primary goal in this fight should be not to have a sustainable pocket. In other words, Charlo needs to be outside, outside of Canelo's range, and Canelo has ring coverage. He needs to be outside of Canelo's range. He needs to pick a spot he needs to be able to jump in the pocket, throw the shots he wants, then get out of the pocket and reset. Let me also say this too, and I don't say it lightly. Canelo is clearly a Hall of Famer. Canelo is defensively blessed. It is extremely hard to hit Canelo in the head, and Canelo knows how to fight small. So what Charlo needs to do when he jumps in the pocket is to make sure that he knows how to jump in the pocket and then go to Canelo's body. Right? He can't headhunt Canelo. Canelo has his head on a swivel. Canelo can drop his hands and dodge your shots up on his head. Canelo also has a short neck. So Canelo knows how to put his head down and hide his chin underneath his shoulders. So if you jump in the pocket, it has to be with a heavy dose of body shots. Now, my point to you is the Miguel Cotto fight, troubling. I thought portions of a fight I thought the opponent should have beaten Canelo in, the Billy Joe Saunders fight. I thought that got a little troubling. Saunders starts to figure it out. Saunders had everything in his favor before the fight in terms of foot speed, in terms of being a southpaw. Right, Saunders had a lot going on. Somehow Canelo lulled Saunders into lingering around the pocket and into leaning right into a Canelo uppercut. Right? If Canelo stops fighting, don't get in the pocket with him. Right? If you jump in the pocket, it has to be with the mindset of jumping out of the pocket. Let me also say this too. Canelo, as great as he is, has had a problem with more mobile fighters to the point where he's been dominated for several round stretches in at least two fights, right? The Mayweather fight. Understand, Floyd comes out and Floyd is standing right in front of Canelo, right? Floyd dips a shoulder. Floyd is throwing jabs to Canelo's body, right? Canelo wasn't able to do much against Floyd. I know one judge, of course, there's always that one judge, had the fight close. But I'm just telling you, you were looking at that fight and you knew that Floyd, a slow starter, was dominating the early rounds. 
And folks, it did not get better in the later rounds. Well, then you have an even more intriguing fight than the Floyd fight. The Floyd fight, Canelo looked too young. Canelo looked in over his head from the opening bell. In the other fight, the Dimitri Bevel fight, right? Canelo comes out and the fight looks a little even early on. I know the judges saw it Canelo early rounds, right? I didn't see it that way. The fight looks a little even to me early on. Then Bevel hits the gas, right? Bevel has Canelo trying to find him in the ring. Bevel's moving. Canelo walks over to Bevel, throws some big shots, but Bevel has his defense ready. I don't care what the official scorecards say. Bevel pulled away from Canelo in that fight. Now, the Floyd fight, the Bevo fight, the Cotto fight, they all tell me, and by the way, none of these fights have anything to do with Canelo's last two fights, right? Those fights tell me that prime Canelo, Canelo, when he's on top of the world, right? The Bevo fight, Canelo's favorite in that fight, right? Bevo, by the way, is fighting out of weight class, wasn't he? Just to understand, those fights tell me that someone with smart movement can pull away from Canelo, right? It's easier said than done. It's very hard. Canelo's a favorite in this fight for a reason. He's certainly a Hall of Famer. But we all have weaknesses, right? We do. And there is a scenario where Jermel Charlo, a plus 259 underdog, simply has too much movement and isn't in the pocket long enough for Canelo to get going. Right? Just understand, the way I'm structuring, the way I'm playing it, you're good if Jermel Charlo wins the fight. You're good. You're good if Canelo gets a stoppage before the midway point of the 11th round. Let me point out, too, that if Canelo doesn't get the stoppage by the midway point of the 11th round, he's going to be in big trouble. Because that will mean that the flashier, faster fighter is actually on the verge of going the distance. By the midway point of the 11th round, people are going to be buzzing. They're going to say, wow, can Charlo pull this off? Right? The underdog will have had wings. Just like people were buzzing toward the end of that Bevo fight. But I need for people to understand the risk involved. Canelo, like Manny Pacquiao enters the ring with a two-round advantage. Look, life's unfair. Don't kill the messenger. I'm just stating the obvious. I know there aren't judges' scorecards as they enter the ring that have two X's on them for Canelo, but I'm just telling you, Canelo's going to have to get hit by a car to lose the first round. You know that. You might see around where the guys are just looking at each other. They're getting acquainted. They're figuring out who the other person is. Neither guy does much. You and I know that if that's the first round or the second round, they're giving that round to Canelo. Right, folks? That's the world we live in. Right? Certain fighters are loved. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's the way it is. You knew, by the way, and I've heard from the Hagler crowd, right? Trust me, I, I've, you know, some of my best friends are Hagler fans. I understand that there's a good argument that if you count the body shots, Hagler beats Ray Leonard. But you knew in your heart that if the fight was competitive, and if Ray Leonard didn't get knocked off his feet, you knew that if Ray just survived the fight, there was a chance he was going to be awarded the decision. Right? That's the reality. 
But if Charlo can do what Bevo did and establish the fact that he can move away from Canelo, he has the legs. He's not going to be sucked into the pocket like Billy Joe Saunders was in a fight that was winnable. Then I think he has a shot. In any event, because the hedge is so delicious, it's better than a plus 200, right? Under 10 and a half rounds is a plus 219. Because the hedge is so delicious, you can swing for the fences with a fighter who is undisputed right now in his weight class, Jamel Charlo, right? You can swing for the fences with him at plus 259, and if he shows up and is simply too small and not powerful enough, then you can say, all right, well, if Canelo finishes him, okay, I'll live for another day, plus I'll make a profit. So I like Charlo simply to win plus 259 with the under 10 and a half plus 219. Now let's talk about some other plays. Erickson Lubin, who's still in his 20s, who is still, in my opinion, one of the elite body punchers in the entire sport. Right? Don't be fooled by the fact that Lubin hasn't won a belt yet. Look at the body punches. You're somehow getting him at a plus 350. Folks, a plus 350. <laughs> I don't even need to know who his opponent is. Right? Understand, his opponent could be Sebastian Fundora, who beat him. His opponent could be Jamel Charlo, who beat him. Right? You tell me I'm getting a plus 350 on Erickson Lubin. I'm getting out of my seat in the sports book. I'm standing in line. Then I'm asking the guy next to me, who's he fighting? Right? I know I'm betting on him. I like Erickson Lubin. The guy he's fighting, Jesus Ramos, is young. Right? He has great legs. He knows how to cut off the ring. I understand that he and his corner think he's the future. But, in my opinion, he doesn't have a lot of ring coverage. In other words, he's a hooker. He's not Deontay Wilder who can hit you from several feet away with a straight right hand. That's not his game, right? Let me also say, too, he's a little bit hook heavy. So Lubin is going to know the angles of the punches, right? This isn't a guy who hides his hands, who has you guessing. No, you know he's going to be throwing hooks. Also, while he's active, while he has the energy of a young guy, he's not a heavy puncher. You have a margin of error. This isn't Gili Zhang, where you make a mistake, you're waking up on the canvas. Then you're getting up and you have to bluff your way through with the ref to continue fighting. Right? That's not this guy. So to me, in a fight where I get the more experienced fighter who's still in his prime, who lost to Sebastian Fundora and now feels he has to redeem himself, and of course who has the added bonus of Charlo leaving the division at least for this fight. And the weight gain here suggests to me that Charlo's never coming back to the division. And I think Lubin is going to be motivated and he's going to be ready, right? Don't be scared off by Lubin interviews where he starts talking about his mental health, right? I'm just telling you mental health in life, not just in boxing, but in life is much bigger than any of us want to concede, right? A lot of people have mental health issues, have self-doubt, have had tough moments where they thought about doing some awful things, right? Don't be too scared off by that. Just understand, this is a guy who has recovered from the Fundora beating, who's not dealing with Fundora here, who's dealing with a young guy who might not be ready for the body shots. By the way, both of these guys are good body shots. I just think Lubin knows how to hide his a little bit better. Now, let's talk about the National Football League, right? This weekend, you have some interesting fights, excuse me, some interesting games. 
in the AFC North, I'll be the division's Huckleberry. This isn't even the best line. Understand, these are lines I got during the week. They've shifted now. These are stale lines. You look at your sports book, what they're offering. But I took the Cleveland Browns and I laid three points. The line's lower than that now, but I laid three points. Cleveland at home against the Baltimore Ravens. Now look, I know Lamar has one of the biggest winning percentages for a starting quarterback. No question about that. And I know if their field goal kicker just kicked that field goal at the end of last week's game, they would have won. Right? I get it. But my goodness, folks, Cleveland has a Super Bowl-level defense. Everyone's talking about the Jet defense, crying out loud. Statistically, statistically, Cleveland's defense is better than the Jet defense. Also, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Deshaun Watson is an elite quarterback. Right? You were looking at the Steeler game, and you saw... Cleveland's offensive line let him down. Also, there were turnovers in that game, fumbles, etc. Turnovers will level talent quickly. You can have the talent advantage and suddenly be losing the game because of turnovers. And let's face it too, that game, Cleveland didn't seem to have anybody who could block T.J. Watt. Right? But all of that said, Watson to me seems to have shaken off a lot of the rust. Right? I think the guy is big time. He's finding Amari Cooper now. I know his defense is big time. I like the Browns laying three points. The next game, believe it or not, for all of Denver's problems, and I got the feeling if I played running back for the Miami Dolphins, given some of those holes the backs are running through, I would have averaged five yards a carry. Right? I agree, Denver's defense has problems. But has anyone figured out that Denver offensively is averaging 5.7 yards per play? Russell Wilson, again, last week, threw for over 300 yards. Jerry Judy is getting his legs back under him after missing game one. He has Cortland Sutton, too, to throw the ball to. Denver's offense is coming into shape. Now, I agree. The season's over for them. They're 0-3. They lost two home games already. But I believe they have more than enough for the Chicago Bears. Right? I like Denver laying three in Chicago. Next, look. I've heard the news and the stats look good. The kid has talent, no doubt about it. C.J. Stroud... Looks like he's the best quarterback from this last draft, doesn't he? He has a strong arm. He has a deep arm. He's bold. Uh, guys could be in his face, and he's making throws. It's impressive. Here's the problem. He's playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. You heard me mention T.J. Watt. I'm telling you, the Steelers have guys who are problems. Also, when I see a defensive guru guy like you know, the Steeler coach. And I see a rookie quarterback, even a promising one at home. I'm going to go with the Steelers. I like the Steelers in this play. Laying three, I get a plus 102. Right? I like the Steelers over the Houston Texans. Finally, <laughs> I know Dallas is big and bad and, you know, I know Dallas has talent all over the field. I know Micah Parsons is all over the field. Uh, some people are starting to compare him to LT. Let me just say I agree with Bill Belichick. He's not LT. I'm a Giants fan. Well, let me just say this. Belichick has New England playing Dallas in Dallas, and they're giving you seven points. Has anyone kept track of the number of picks Dak has thrown over, let's say, the last two seasons. I think that uh, New England has the defense. New England has the coaching. I'm not expecting Mac Jones and the offense to flood the scoreboards, but I'm expecting them to keep it close. I like New England. I got seven points. 
If you want to take an alternative line, think about the plus seven and a half. That extra half point is worth a lot up in this range of the point spread, right? Because your team can lose by seven and you still collect. Just food for thought. Anyway, I like, uh, I took the Patriots plus seven against the Dallas Cowboys earlier in the week. The line now is actually six and a half, right? My point to you is casinos are offering alternative lines. Think about New England plus seven and a half. That's how I see the NFL this weekend. That's how I see boxing this weekend. Let me hear from you. If there's a fight I haven't mentioned or if there's a fight I have mentioned, if there are football games I haven't mentioned or if there are football games I have mentioned that you want to share your take on, I hope you do that in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.